It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? amen. Thank, uh, appreciate Pastor giving me a chance to share God's Word. We're glad you're here. Amen. And uh, you're in a safe place to hear a dangerous message, one that can change your life. And so that's what Reverend, uh, Reverend Briggs said, and I never forgot that. So, and we're here that we want to be a blessing, and we're just here to help, amen? Amen. amen. And so we're thankful for all that God's doing. Also, amen. appreciate Sister Polk. She's such a sweetheart. And uh, before I get all emotional up here, we'll just leave it at that. She's great. And so we love each and every one of you, and we're thankful to be here. How many know God loves you today? Amen. 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 I'd like to direct your attention to the book of Acts, the 28th chapter. It's the last chapter in the book of Acts, if you're following along in your Bible. And uh, this is, I shared this probably about a year ago, um, back in Bakersfield. It's been on my mind for about a week now. And um, I, pray, I pray it'll be a blessing to you. It's what the Lord has for us, and I believe it will be. Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, beginning to read in verse 1. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Malta. There's a couple different ways to pronounce this. I'm going to call it Malta for the sake of time. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked, howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. And I'd like to take verse 5 for our text. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. And with the help of God, I'd like to minister. And we need, we need God's help. Amen? Amen. Without, without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Amen? I say with me, all things. All things. And so I'd like to preach on the title of the message for just a little while, Shaking Off Vipers or the Vipers of Malta. I'd like to ask Pastor to pray for me, sir. Thank you. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, God, for this opportunity to be gathered in your house, and we're thankful for everyone that is here. God, we just ask your blessing, God, upon each one, those that have been here many times and those that are here for their first time. God, you love each and every one. You know the need in each and every heart. God, every one of us has a need for you. We just ask you to bless this message tonight. Help Reverend Rossi to administer your word according to your will. We thank you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Shaking off vipers. Well, this setting is the last, this last chapter of the book of Acts transpires after they had just gone shipwreck. And uh, Paul was a prisoner, but he had given instruction to his, his, cap, his captors, if you will, that uh, you all need to stay on the ship, don't get in the lifeboats, or we're not going to make it. And they listened. And so during the course, even though he was, in a, he was the prisoner, he became kind of the leader of the ship as time. The centurion started to listen to him. You know, God will do that. You might be in a certain situation, but if you'll trust God, God will move you to the forefront and, and help you. Amen? Yes. Amen. If you'll humble yourself, God will bless. And he really, he really knows how to do that. And um, so he began to instruct them, and as a result, they, they went shipwrecked. But they all, made it to the isle, they all made it to this island of Malta safely. None of them perished. And... As I just read to you what took place, these barbarous people, what do you mean barbarous? Well, basically the civilized world back then was Rome. And if you weren't part of Rome, you were considered a barbarian. That was basically the way, that's the way the Romans viewed it. You were uncultured. It didn't mean you were stupid, it just meant you, weren't, you didn't know the civil world of Rome. Are you with me? Yes. All right. And so we notice here in this portion of Scripture that what happened is these barbarians began to help them. He said they, the people showed him no little kindness. In fact, they showed him quite a bit. For they, received, for they kindled the fire and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And I think this is really important just to share it off just in, right as we begin the message this evening that sometimes uncivilized people can seem more civilized than the civilized. <laughs> I've ran into a lot of rednecks that are really a blessing to me. Amen. Amen. And... Uh, 
appreciate Sister Rossi. She's a blessing. And, and uh, she's a country girl. And a couple of her family members have helped me out. The <laughs> so anyway, that's my wife, by the way. She'll get me back, I'm sure, but no, I appreciate her. So they'll help you fix your car, you know. Help you city slickers make it, you know, survive if the economy crushes. And so God's good to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. But they're sometimes more civilized, if you will, than, than the civilized. And it's also, I wanted to share this, that every single person you come in contact with is, is one miracle away from a transformed life. Amen. No, we have no enemies uh, except the devil. Amen? Amen? God loved the whole world and gave his life for everybody. So everybody we come in contact with is just one touch from a, from a transformed life and becoming a child of Almighty God. And we need to see them that way and, and, and realize that God did die for the whole world. And God died for you today. And you say, well, I don't know. I feel a little uncomfortable. These people seem like they're a little different. That's okay. I felt the same way when I came. And what I found out was they were just really Christians. And they really loved me. And I was, that was kind of foreign to me. It wasn't just a ritual. And, uh, and it, was, it was almost too real. You know, when something's fake, it's easy to dismiss it. But when it's real, you're just like, whoa, I got to do something with this. I can't ignore it. It's real. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And some people would prefer it to be not real because then they can dismiss it. But when it's real, you have to, if you're, if you're a seeker of truth, you have to do something with it. And so we see in the situation here that these, these barbarians, as the Bible calls them, or barbarous people, help them. They received them, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. They began to try to help them out. And all of a sudden, as this was going on, it says, and when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks. So notice now, Paul was one of the leaders, but he was gathering sticks. He wasn't too big to help out. He didn't just sit in the corner while everybody else did the work. He was willing to, and it, this is, I like this because all God's people are humble. And um, I was just looking at a picture Sister Rossi took the other day, and, uh, of, of, or just yesterday, of all the brethren sitting there as pastor was teaching, and uh, pastor was kneeling down. You know, he's a humble man, and uh, he loves you, and he cares about you. And if he knew I was going to say that, he probably wouldn't have me preach, but he, he loves you. And so, uh, pre- <laughs> so but he, he's, he's a humble man, and if he does try to straighten something out, it's because he wants to help you. Amen? Because if he lets it go, it could, it could hurt you. So he handles it. And so God loves us. Amen? Amen. Because we're here to help. We're here to help. And so this man here, uh, Paul, was not, he wasn't, he had no ego. He just wanted to help. He just wanted to reach people for Jesus. Whatever was necessary uh, to do that, that's all that we want to do today is reach you for Christ, uh, to share with you a man named Jesus, how much he loved you and what he did for you and how he went to a cross and died. Even though you didn't know him, he knew you and you were in his mind uh, when he laid his, when he laid his all on the cross of Calvary. Uh, As he looked into the future, he saw those many brethren and sisters that he would bring to glory. uh, Because as I used to say, I I have one son, Jesus didn't want to be an only child. He wanted to have a whole bunch of brothers and sisters around the throne to glorify God with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And and so we could also become sons and daughters of God. And so as we say, as we look into this a little bit more, as Paul is getting these bundles of sticks and he's helping, as I begin to read in verse 3, and when Paul gathered the bundle of sticks, he laid them on the fire, and there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. He got bit by this viper. There he was just trying to be a blessing, trying to help, but here the devil once again attacks him. And you know, this happens in everybody's life. Sometime in the course of your life, you're going to get bit, not by maybe a literal snake, but the spiritual snake, the old devil. You're going to get bit. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, it says that God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. This day it was raining, and they were trying to get a fire going. And, you know, times and time and chance happen to us all. But you're going to notice a difference when we get through this, that God has come to give us the power to shake off the vipers in our lives. God gives the child of God, yes, he's going to get bit just like anybody else, but he'll overcome the bite, and people will stop and they'll say, wait a minute, this guy must be a god. Well, a little g but a son of God. Amen? A king's kid. A royal, a royal heir, if you will. And so as we look at this a little bit more, this viper came, bit him. And when it bit him, they began to question what was going on. When the barbarians saw this venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. 
There's got to be something wrong with this guy. He just got out of shipwreck. Now he just got bit on his hand. What's the deal? And they were sure that there, there, something had to be wrong with Paul. And, but that was not the case. Now, it reminds us, if in, this brings me to a certain place, and I'm not going to take you there. I'm just going to kind of share with you what happened in Numbers chapter 21. There's an account where the children of Israel are traveling through the desert, and they got discouraged because of the way. And as a result of it, they began to murmur and complain, and the Lord let these serpents out, and these serpents bit them. And what was going on is God was illustrating them physically what was already happened to them spiritually. They had already been spiritually bitten, and they became unthankful. They became ungrateful for what God had done by taking them out of Egypt. And they, they began to murmur against the very man that was trying to help them, Moses, and ultimately God. And so as this began to develop, uh, the, the, Moses prayed. They realized their fault. They realized their failure. They came to Moses and said, we've spoken against you and against God. And so God prayed, and God told them, what I want you to do is I want you to put a, a brazen serpent on a pole, and I want you to lift it up, and everybody that sees that and puts fastens their eyes on that, that uh, image, if you will, they'll be healed. And it's really where we get our medical symbol from today. Would you see if you're part of the medical corps or something like that, the, the serpents wrapping around the pole, that's really where it comes from. And so if they were to look at that, they would be healed. Well, later on, Jesus made a reference to this when he was talking to Nicodemus there when he's preaching about his famous speech about being born again in John 3.16. And, and um, he said in John 3.14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so Jesus was letting him know that everybody, every one of you have been bitten. Every one of you need an anti-venom, so to speak. And Jesus was lifted up on that cross that if we would look at him and accept what he did on the cross of Calvary, we would be saved. We would be, the sting would be reversed, so to speak. And we would be made whole. And I remember years ago, Reverend Anderson was preaching for us in, in, uh, in Bakersfield, California. And he shared an illustration, and I'm going to use it because it really touched my heart that day and was powerful. How many, know how, how many here know how an anti-venom is made? All right, it's pretty cool. And I didn't know this because I wasn't learned. I'm just having fun. But So the way that, it, way that it's made is they'll take an animal that is perfectly innocent and they'll inject it with the poison. I just watched a YouTube video of them doing this with, uh, for a scorpion. Take the poison from a scorpion, inject it into this horse. Just a little bit. And over the course of time, they'll inject a little bit more and a little bit more. They start off maybe just like a, a small little portion, and after it's all said and done, and the video they're talking about how it'd be upwards of maybe like the equivalent of like 10 about, or 100 stings. But the horse just handles it. The, blood, the body builds up antibodies and adjusts, so it doesn't even get sick. It just, it just handles it. And then they take that blood from that horse, and they make an anti-venom. Well, guess what? The devil bit our Lord on the cross. The Bible says he became sin. And he, the devil bit Jesus, and he, has, he hung there on the cross. And when that, when that perfect sacrifice, that sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ, took the sting of the serpent's bite, God took the blood of Jesus and made it the anti-venom to wash away sin in your life and in your heart, to wash it completely out of your life. And so we see here what God does is when we accept what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, God gives us the anti-venom so then we may be bitten, but when we apply it, instead of dying from that sin, we live. Hallelujah! We're alive! We overcome the situation! Difficulties come all come to every one of us, church! But when you look to Christ and you trust in God and you trust the finished work of Calvary and what Jesus did, that, that, that anti-venom, the blood of Jesus Christ will give you the power to rise, to stand up and overcome what the devil has already done in your life. You will fulfill the prophecy. The devil may have bit your heel, but you'll crush his head in your life. Amen. And you'll stand strong. Amen? Amen? So as I get ready to close, the Bible says here in the fifth verse that Paul shook off the beast into the fire and he felt no harm. And they sat there and they're like, what just happened? What just happened? What just took place? He shook it off. You know, the devil is going to attack you. Yeah. Probably already has. You say, well, or I made a mistake, or I messed up, or God forbid I sinned. 
by the power of Jesus Christ today, somebody might be looking at you like, man, he messed up. If you'll look, if you'll look to Christ and you'll trust the Lord with all your heart, you can shake that beast off. Yeah. And instead of them going, what's wrong with them? They'll go, there's really something to that guy. He didn't quit. There's something to that lady. She didn't give up. She pressed on. She went back to the cross. He, he found his way back to the cross of Calvary. He partook of the blood of Jesus. And look, he's living for Jesus today. He's alive. He's a son of God. There is a reality. People want to see a reality. Amen? Yes. Amen. Because when we know it's real, when we see the reality in somebody else's life, it gives us courage that if they can do it, we can also do it. And Jesus did it first. And so as I, as I get ready to close, he shook it off. And this is what they said. When they looked, howbeit when they looked, and when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds. You'll have people sometimes look at you like, what's, what's up with you? Why, do you? why does that guy go to church all the time? They might think you're a little peculiar at first. But as they begin to see that there's a reality in your life, they say, no, he's just a real Christian. Amen. She's just a real Christian. Hallelujah. And they'll change their mind. And just like one brother, one fellow did, he kept asking me questions about the church. I said, well, do you want to go? He said, I keep bugging him. I might as well. He came, got saved, and read way more of the Bible in like three months than I did the entire time. He was taking off faster than I was. Hang on, man. I'm the one that brought you to church. And he started motivating me to get more, even more in. And so God's good, amen? Amen. And so when you take that anti-venom, when you partake of the blood of Jesus Christ, God will make you more than a conqueror to him that loved us. As you bow your heads and close your eyes in reverence to God as pastor comes. Amen.